uh, for her welfare and her safety. And if anybody can help us to locate her, we would uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, if they could ring Bray Garda Station 01-666-5300. Or in, in, we're also looking for this black cash kai, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And if anybody comes across that car or sees that car, if they could ring 999 and tell us where it is and not to approach the driver or anybody. Just call the Gardaí, please. And they can also ring the confidential telephone line or 999 or 112. Can you tell us, uh, Superintendent, about uh, Justine's last movements? Did she was she on her way home? Did she get off a bus? Yes, we believe um, she was going about her business yesterday, and she was on her way home to Enniskerry. And she was, we believe, or we think, she may have been abducted from that area. So we're working uh, on that at the moment, trying to clarify her last movements, looking for CCTV, uh, taking statements from witnesses, and we have. Um, a large uh, investigation team working on it. Do you have any idea how many people were in that cash cow? Uh, we don't know for certain, but it would appear that there was just one person, uh, from what we know at the moment. As, as uh, you know, it's still an early stage in the investigation, and uh, so we don't have all the facts yet. Do you have the registration number? Do you think it's possible that could be a false registration number, or do you think that's a real registration number that you've tried well, to certainly have? we'd like to talk to the driver of that vehicle uh, to eliminate him from our inquiries at the very least and uh, we think there is a connection but uh, we're trying to clarify what that connection is. And and have you identified the driver of that vehicle from um, the courts? No, we haven't spoken to him. No, have you identified him? We have a, an idea who the registered owner is, uh, but we'd like to clarify who the actual driver was. But it's not Just one more reported stolen or anything? Pardon? The vehicle wasn't reported stolen or anything? No, it's not a stolen vehicle. Okay, thanks a million, folks. Thanks very much. On the 19th of May 2018, a family by the name of Valdez, living in Enniskerry, would be struck by tragedy. Enniskerry is a beautiful village in County Wicklow, located just 30 minutes outside Dublin. Wicklow is known as the Garden of Ireland and I would safely say Enniskerry would be the centre of it as far as villages for its beauty. One of its claims to fame is the movie Leap Year, starring Amy Adams and is one of the locations used in the movie. That is the bus scene towards the end. I'm a bit of a romantic and I'm usually not a fan of movies made in Ireland that are not starring Irish actors. They usually butcher the accent, but this wasn't so with this movie. They did a great job and I love it. The Valdez family consisted of Dan Lino and Teresa and their only child, Justine. In the tradition of many Filipino families, the parents had come to Ireland to work in the 1990s, sending their wages home to their families. Justine was raised by her grandparents in the Philippines and in 2015, at the age of 21, she decided to join her parents in Ireland to study and build a life for herself, just like her parents had. She studied accountancy and finance and worked two jobs to help support her parents and fund her education. She had a part-time job as a carer and also worked in a restaurant in Bray. One of her work colleagues would go on to say, quote, Oh, she was fun, a really, really nice girl. The family of three lived in a cottage on the grounds of Charville House, a stately home owned by a wealthy family. Danlino was the greensman and Teresa was the housekeeper who looked after the main house. On Saturday the 19th of May 2018, 24-year-old Justine went about her day. Her first appointment was to break our station to seek to renew her residency permit and then on to the gym for a workout. During this day she kept in contact with her mother. How close they were would be seen by her phone data later on. A total of 63 messages between them that day the last one being at 4.20pm, asking her to pick up some bread on her way home. At 5.40pm, she would get the number 185 bus from Bray to Enniskerry, and from here she would have a walk of nearly three kilometres home to the cottage she shared with her parents. The bus would arrive at 6.10pm in Enniskerry, later than usual. The bus stop was a 10-minute walk from near the entrance to Paris Court House, a beautiful large country estate visited by over a million people a year. It is voted by National Geographic to be the third in line to having the most beautiful gardens in the world. But unknown to Justine when she stepped off the bus near this wonderful place, an evil predator was watching and waiting for her. 
Minutes later, as she walked along the narrow winding road, she would be abducted. Was she stalked and this was planned, or was this just a random thought followed through by someone? When Justine didn't arrive home and there had been no communication from her to her parents, they began to get worried, as this was so unlike her. There was no thought that she might have bumped into a friend or missed the bus home. As if she had, she would have let her parents know. In the meantime, Gardie would get a call from a woman who told them that she was driving on the road near the entrance to Paris Courthouse at around 6.20pm. She described seeing a black car pulled into the side of the road with the boot open. It did not have any lights or indicators on. As she passed, she heard screaming and noticed an Asian woman sitting on the side of the boot, looking out towards her. She heard a slapping sound and a male voice shouting angrily. She pulled in and called 999 as the car sped away. This woman did not follow the car as she had her child with her. Soon after, the guardie received another call from a man that was driving home from Bray. He told the guardie he noticed what he thought was a little girl waving out the back of a vehicle at him, looking concerned but wasn't sure if she was just waving at him or looking for help. When he got home, he spoke to his wife about the incident and only then at 7.30pm did he make the call to the guardie. By this time, Justine's parents also had phoned the guardie. At 11pm that night, they called to their house to try and ascertain Justine as a person and reasons why she didn't come home. A description was taken of her. She was five foot tall, petite build with long dark hair. The clothes she was wearing that day were her gym gear, grey leggings, white t-shirt, trainers and a dark jacket. When the guardie received the phone call from the woman, they went to the road she mentioned. There they would find Justine's smash phone and a bag with bread inside it. Gardie at this stage believed that Justine was in grave danger. Helicopters and patrol cars were dispatched in a bid to find her. They had a description of the car, a black Nissan Qashqai. Gardie tracked every matching vehicle in the Dublin and Wicklow area in the hours after the abduction. They combed through CCTV and discovered a black Qashqai SUV following the bus Justine was on from Bray to Enniskerry and it had overtaken en route. The guardie felt they had their suspect and now all they had to do is find him. But time was of the essence as the guardie believed Justine could still be alive. Soon they would have the exact car and registration number which they tracked to a woman, Nicole Hennessy. It was 3am when this breakthrough came and by 10am on Sunday the 20th of May the guardie felt they had their right person who was driving the black SUV. Nicole's husband and father to her two children, one which was only born in the September of the previous year. His name was Mark Hennessy, a 40-year-old man, a construction worker, who worked in the Tala area. He was described as a hard-working, quiet man, a good father to his children and an obliging neighbour. But he was also a serious drinker, whose life appeared to be spiralling out of control in recent weeks. Fueled possibly by not only excessive drinking, but the consumption of illegal drugs. Hennessy grew up in Clomlech Fields Estate on the western side of the Shangannon Road in Ballybrack in Dublin, where much of it comprises of social housing. Hennessy would eventually end up living in Woodlawn Park in Bray after meeting his wife, who originally came from Wales. Mark, how do you find the car? Absolutely beautiful now. It drives really well. Delighted with it. And uh, the staff treated me very well here as well. So uh, I'm delighted with me, boy. Brilliant. And tell me the, all the, the, the features in it. You were saying, like the reverse camera and that, the safety feature of it for parking and that. This one has, I think, the panoramic roof as well, has it? Yeah. It has, yeah, yeah. So you're happy with the purchase, yeah? Absolutely delighted with it. Well, there you go. You've heard it there, folks. When Gardy spoke to Hennessy's wife, she explained that there had been a steady decline in their marriage in recent months because of his drinking and drug taking. She told Gardy that she last saw Hennessy that Saturday afternoon. He went to work at around 7.30 a.m. and returned home just after 3 p.m. and left again around 5.25 p.m. He had told her he was going for a drink but never returned home and she had no idea where he was. The Gardaí went to the pubs down along the Strand in Bray and in one pub it was confirmed that he had been in and only stayed for 10 minutes and had just watched some football and left. CCTV showed him leaving the pub 
at 5.41 p.m. and walking out to the car park where his car was parked. He appeared to be on the phone at the time and left in his car two minutes later. Half an hour after that, he was driving behind the 185 bus that Justine was on. CCTV footage from the bus confirmed this. At 11pm that night, he returned to the pub. He spoke with a couple of people at the door of the pub who knew his family and then he left. So what did Hennessy do between 5.41pm and 11pm and then after 11pm on that Saturday night? And most importantly, where was Justine? When Gardy identified Hennessy as the suspect in Justine's abduction, his family and friends helped search for him. Gardy held a press conference on the Sunday, asking people to be on the lookout for Hennessy and his car. And in an unusual step, they gave out the registration of the car in the hopes of finding Hennessy quicker and saving Justine's life. This move paid off. At around 8pm that evening, they got a phone call from a woman stating that she was travelling behind Hennessy, heading towards Cherrywood Business Park. Gardy arrived quickly and found Hennessy sitting in the driver's seat of his car. He was covered in blood. Three Gardy surrounded the car and members of the Civil Defence Force blocked the car in. When the officers saw the blood and Hennessy holding a Stanley knife, known as a box cutter to some, they went into action straight away. Hennessy had cut his arm from wrist to elbow and Gardy, not knowing if Justine was in the car with him, immediately tried to break into the car. As they did this, Hennessy made a motion with the knife towards the passenger side, where Gardy believed Justine was on the floor. They felt he motioned to kill her. The most senior officer there then took the decision to fire his gun. The bullet hit Hennessy in the arm, which ricocheted into his chest. The Gardy approached the car and managed to get the car door open, and there was no Justine. The Garda pulled the fob from the ignition and opened the boot of the car, and again, no Justine. At this stage, Hennessy was taken out of the car and treated by emergency services. Hennessy was awake and they begged him to know where Justine was, but he remained silent and died a few minutes later. He had bled to death and was pronounced dead at the scene at 8.38pm. This was devastating to the Gardaí, especially the Garda who had fired the shot, as to him he was sure Justine was in the car and had fired the fatal shot to save her. When the Gardaí searched the car, they found a bottle of Jack Daniels and a note covered in blood. Immediately, this note was bagged and taken to Forensic Science Ireland and analysed to see what was written on the note and would it be a clue to where Justine was. Pugs Castle and Sorry were the words on this note. They knew then they were not going to find Justine alive. On Monday the 21st of May, Gardaí went to the area Pugs Castle Lane in Rathmichael and there they found a sock and a purse. They knew immediately they were in the right place. The army was brought in to help as it was quite an extensive area, including a disused golf club. The army set off on the left and the Gardaí set off on the right. One of the Garda, for some strange reason, zeroed in on a particular spot, walked down through the gores and there he found Justine. She was dead and later autopsy results will conclude that Justine was killed within an hour of her abduction. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled. The on the body of Justine Valdez has confirmed that she was strangled. Gorthy say a note left in a car used in the abduction of the student led to the discovery of the woman's body in South County Dublin yesterday. The note also expressed remorse. Our crime correspondent Paul Reynolds now reports. The search for evidence continued all day today on land beside the disused golf course in Rathmichael in South County Dublin, the place where the body of Justine Valdez was found. The 24-year-old Filipino student was murdered and her body concealed after she was attacked and bundled into a car as she was walking to her home in Enniskerry on Saturday evening. Gardi say within 10 minutes of receiving a call about the abduction, the Garda helicopter was in the air and three patrol cars were searching for a woman. However, it's believed Justine was strangled within three quarters of an hour of having been taken. 
She was then dragged through here, her purse, identification card and sock falling off, en route to the dense gorse where her body was found. The Gardaí were relieved that they were able to bring Justine home to her parents, even though it was devastating having to break the news to them that she was no longer alive. It was extremely traumatic for Justine's parents, but to them the next important step was to bring her home to the Philippines to be buried. A GoFundMe page was set up to raise €10,000 needed. Within 24 hours, 80000 was raised, and in total 110000 was raised. The people of Ireland were devastated and wanted to do anything they could to help Justine's family. On the Friday and Saturday, Justine lay in repose as is tradition for the Philippines. Hundreds of people filed in and out of the chapel to pay their respects over the two days, many of them friends from the Filipino community, but many more total strangers compelled to stand in solidarity. Shortly before the reposing, the grieving parents insisted on thanking all those who had helped them through the dark days. Their statement also revealed the hopes and dreams of Justine, so cruelly shattered. Quote, Our daughter's plan was to settle in Ireland, buy a house here and make a new life. She was a fun-loving, wonderful, caring daughter and friend. She is always in our hearts and in the hearts of the people of Ireland. No connection was found between Justine and Hennessy. Of course, he may have seen her in the restaurant she worked in part-time or seen her at the bus stop and became infatuated with her. Or it may have just been a random abduction and murder. While a lot of people that knew Hennessy had nothing bad to say about him, he did have a dark side. His marriage was ending and he was in debt. He had been caught drinking and driving. He was making a nuisance of himself in pubs when drunk, even getting thrown out for harassing women and young girls. He was also on Tinder and other dating apps. He was also caught trying to break into a house where there was a young 18-year-old home alone. When the guardie were called, he said he was at the wrong house and he was let go. His drug habit was getting worse and on the night he abducted and killed Justine, he was seen by witnesses driving around and trying to buy drugs. At the inquest at Dublin's coroner's court into Justine's death, the jury returned a verdict of unlawful killing. This was due to the fact that Hennessy was killed himself and therefore was not tried and available to defend himself in a court of law. It was deemed that the Garda who shot Hennessy acted within the confines of the law. Hennessy's DNA was put on the national database and Garda are leaving Hennessy as an open investigation in the hopes of linking him to other missing women cases or unsolved murders. Hennessy's wife and children returned to live in Wales to try and build a new life. Nicole was absolutely devastated after what had happened and couldn't bring herself to continue to live in Ireland. Before Hennessy was shot dead, he had made a phone call to her from the car, quote, I've done something awful, and he confessed that he had kidnapped and killed Justine. Justine was brought home to her native country, the Philippines. It was six weeks after her death that she was buried. Her parents wanted to wait until after her 25th birthday which was the Friday before she was buried. They also believe that the soul doesn't leave the body until the 40th day. Hundreds of mourners dressed all in white walked in procession. A photograph of Justine and the names of her family members were printed on a banner, paraded through the narrow streets and directly behind it a jeep towed, a decorated chariot containing Justine's silver coffin. After the funeral in the Catholic Church, balloons were released. Justine's parents returned to Ireland a year later as they felt this is where their memories are of her. On her fifth anniversary of her death this year, they gave an interview stating that they still live with the trauma of losing their only child. Quote, Thinking of you each day with an aching heart. So we whisper and call your name every time just to ease the pain of losing you. We love you and miss you terribly, Justine, our princess. <laughs>